Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. God bless you. Yeah, those who didn't come did not know what to say. That shows you why you must be here all the time. When I say good morning, God bless you, you say amen. And then you point your hands to me and say, God bless you too. I also need God's blessing. All right, shall we go one more time? Good morning, God bless you. Amen. God bless you too. Amen. Is the law of sowing and reaping. Several times, or almost all the time that I'd come here with my wife, Dr. Andrew Lockett and his wife are fond of saying what I've done. They never mentioned theirs. And I remember the day and time when we just landed in London in 1994. With my five children, we were settling down for the first time in a very hostile environment because of the weather. I'd never lived inside winter before. It was extremely cold that morning. And right at our door, the bell was pressed. And I came out to look at a total stranger that I'd never met before. He was a delivery man. And he brought us a person as big as that. One for me and one for my wife. And it was the most beautiful winter coat I'd ever seen in my life. Guess who sent them all the way from Charlotte to London? <laughs> Dr. Andrew Lockhart. I couldn't part with it. I'm sorry, it was like a mantu. If you enter my home in the UK today, you still find it there. Thank God I've not grown any bigger. <laughs> if you've read the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that includes my weight. <laughs> I can't thank him, you know. And then we came to America in the year 2004 was settling here for children a college education in Georgia and I came to minister here who we about going out when he said he can't go today you and Mrs. B are just arriving and you will be needing a car and he gave us a Mercedes-Benz 600 class I'd never seen it before to door and I said what is this he said this is for you and Mrs. B I'm in trouble <laughs> Because it was just, it blew my mind. And so there's nothing I've done for him that he does not deserve. And I will keep on coming till the Lord returns. <laughs> that you don't see me some of the time does not mean we are not connecting. Because either he will call me, I will call him. And every time I ask, how is my Timisha doing? Because you are my Timisha too. You're married to my brother, therefore, you're part of the family. I thank God for every one of you, especially old faces who had stayed faithful and true. Thank you for being there. I'm seeing Pastor's brother for the first time since I've been here for two nights. You showed up today like a submarine. But I'm glad you're here all the same. Bless God. When I got here on Friday... I didn't discuss this with doctor, this is liberty, and because of relationship. And I saw the environment said, Lord, what happened to these folks that used to be here? And I remember what happened to me when God said, stay in England for 18 months. My wife and I went on vacation. We didn't go to settle. Three days into the vacation, God said, you're going to stay in this country, and they didn't tell me for how long, but it lasted 18 months, doctor. By the time I got back home, our 5,000 seat auditorium, one third of the auditorium was filled to capacity. Two third had gone. And I stood there and I said, God, how can you ask me to do something that will backfire on the ministry like this? And that was when he began to teach me 
the difference between the crowd and the church. You know, many times you think where you find people. If God's intention and desire is to fill a building with all kinds of people, then footballers are doing a better job. Do you understand me? But when you are going to see stakeholders and not spectators, it takes time. A number of things could happen. So on Friday, two things hit me. Number one, I found myself in the upper coast of Ephesus. Because when Paul got there, there were only, you want me to repeat? I can show you. He got there. A great church had been planted there, but he found only 12 people. And he began to teach them and separated them into the school of Tyrannos. And within two years of imparting their lives, the whole of Asia had the gospel. So you don't need multitudes. You need spectators. You don't need spectators. You need stakeholders. When I stood on the platform of the Lateran Assembly that year in 1996 and I saw two-thirds people gone and one-third filled, my heart was grieved. And suddenly the Holy Spirit broke through. He said, ask the people to buy 50 dozen more chairs. One of the prophecies I hesitated giving. Because it doesn't make sense. You expect God to make sense, don't you? How, how big is, it, is the capacity of your brain to capture what he wants to do? He said, tell them to buy 50 dozen more chairs. You recall this, honey? And I said, the Lord just said to me, we are adding 50, more, 50 dozen more chairs to these empty chairs. Because he said, you will not see wind, you will not see rain, but you are going to find water. And we bought 50 dozen more chairs and added it, Pastor, within three, four weeks, we needed more because from left, right, and center, all the four winds of heaven began to blow over that ministry and people who had never met before showed up and filled the auditorium to capacity. I remember in, in Hong Kong, my wife was there, we were preaching for Maurice Sarulo in a 10,000-seat auditorium. And we got there the first day I was to preach. There were 500 people. And the Lord said, prophesy to the city. And I did. By the third day in the evening, they were knocking at the door because there was no space for people to come in. Don't get discouraged. God wants to walk in you so that he can walk through you. And by the time he finishes with you today, guess what's going to happen? You become an example to follow and not a mistake to avoid. In the name of Jesus Christ. That was the first thing that hit me. I didn't talk to you. And that was why I was not willing to go anywhere yesterday. I wanted to pray. I wanted to know things for myself. Lord, what's happening here? The second thing that hit me. All those beautiful guys. On our guitar. On our keyboard. That would play music and we dance. And I said, Lord, where did I go? I didn't ask you. I didn't ask any instructions. I didn't say, what is happening here? And he then said to me. Go back into your Bible and see when worship was first mentioned. There was no musical instrument, no guitar, no keyboard. True worship is not entertainment. And if you find people who just want to play to the gallery to entertain people, then you don't have the true church because we worship him in spirit and in truth. And I want to thank those men and women who stood here without any accompanying instrument to really worship God from their heart. Thank you for a job well done. God bless you. Don't be discouraged because you are bringing true worship to God. When music fades, when there are no instruments, then you start knowing it's all about him. It's not entertainment. And, and I, with that, those two thoughts in my heart, I come to bless you today. I want you to say to two people, three people, four people, as many as you can reach, and say, it's been declared and we believe it, he shall be so here. No more luck. Yeah. I say, I want you to say, to, to give them high five and say, brother, no more luck. Sister, no more luck. Yesterday ended last night, no more luck. No more luck. No more luck. No 
In the name of Jesus, no more luck. The building you saw taught me that there's no recession in heaven. And you didn't see anything. That was just something caught on YouTube. If you see the whole thing, you'll be wondering where did this come from? Did it descend from heaven? We signed the contract in May. We broke grounds and they started building. Italian company. You know what's going to cost us to build it? $40 million. I didn't come here to say partner with us, but thank you for even thinking of that. Because that's not my intention. I just want to show you what we're doing. We signed the contract and brought, <laughs> and let all boats go to God. The first $10 million was paid without any sweat. Do you understand me? And then March, we are paying another one. And then uh, I think after March, June, we are paying another one. And we're paying like that as we deliver, so we pay. And guess what? When it's dedicated, it will be dedicated debt free. Not one penny will be borrowed. Where do I have the other city for this? Where is it coming from? Because of the word of God that says no more lack. No more lack. Who told you it's only in America that they spend dollars? We spend it in Nigeria too. And that the foreigners will not sign any contract with you except it's denominated in dollar. My sister-in-law saw the building and said, Uncle I said, yes, why are you building that in Nigeria? Can't you bring that to UK? I said, good things came from Nazareth before, and the best of things are going to come from Africa too. Do you understand me? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see. God came out of Nazareth. He's now about to come from Nigeria. <laughs> I, love, I look forward to seeing you someday when you come there and say, wait a minute, where did this come from? It came from the heart of the Father. And if you would truly open your heart and receive what I've brought today, it began on Friday, but don't worry that you are not here. And Saturday, don't worry. But today you're going to get the real thing because you are going to make a solemn vow against poverty and lack. You are going to give quick notice to lack in your life and give quick notice and serve quick notice to poverty. You say, on this day, on Sunday the 28th of August 2016, by the grace of the living God and the boldness of the Holy Spirit, I evicted lack and poverty from my life. Turn your Bible with me, if you will, to Psalm 34. The same psalm of David that he wrote after he feigned madness and pretended to be mad before the king of Philistines after they have captured him. He threw saliva on his own beard and acted like a madman so that they could let him go. Those who were here on Friday knew it was an angelic intervention. The angel of the Lord stood between him and his enemies, and they couldn't hurt him until he escaped. He escaped to become the class captain of classless people, those in debt, those discontent, and those totally uh, 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 dissatisfied about life. They don't have nothing. They had nothing to show, about 400 of them, and they joined him, and in a period of time, they became mighty men. In that psalm, something I never touched since Friday was reserved for today. I'm going to read from verse number 8. It says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blesses the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his sins. There is no want. That's the word lack. If you have my type of Bible, this is New King James Version, where you see want, you see figure one, you go in the middle column, you see lack there. 
There is no one to those who fear him. Verse number 10 is my contemplation today, and you're going to read it with me. Psalm 34, verse number 10, ready, read. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Read it one more time. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Do I have anyone here today who came with a single focus, a single intention to seek the Lord and not to seek things? You remember Jesus was baptized by John, right? But who baptized the other first? Who was the first to baptize the other? Was it John? Was it Jesus? Oh, please talk to me. John baptized Jesus. Thank you, Pastor. But I disagree with you. Because if John baptized Jesus first, and then it would be his, not Pierre, it would be his mentor. But when Mary came into the house of Elizabeth, he said, I heard the sound of your salutation, and the baby me lived for joy. And John was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb because the baptizer and the Holy Ghost was inside Mary. Jesus baptized John first so that John could baptize Jesus later. Go ahead, doctor. You got it? Yes, sir. But when he left the baptism of John, he was going in John chapter 1. Let's quickly look at it. I'm going somewhere this morning. And I'm not in a hurry, you know. I'm not in a hurry. If you are, you can go. I will finish when I finish. Because I don't come every now and then like I used to. So I'm going to give it to you today, Tamisha. Good measure. <laughs> Press down. Shaking together. And running over. I'm going to download heaven on you. And yeah. when you leave this place, yeah. you are bold to say no more luck. Yeah. In verse 35... Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus, as he worked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed who? Jesus. Then Jesus turned, seeing them following, said to them, What? Hey, brothers and sisters, what is it? What do you seek? Remember, it is those who seek the Lord that shall not lack any good thing. Many people coming into church are seeking things. That's why you lack. What do you seek? They stood there and said, we are seeking nothing. Where do you live? Where do you live, Lord? We want to dwell where you dwell. Where do you live? And he took two of them to his place that night, and they passed the night there. Do you know what happened? One day. One day encounter. Do you know what happened? Jesus knew he had found two disciples. The two disciples knew they had found the Messiah. From that day, henceforth, there was no going back. That's what happens to those who seek the Lord and are not seeking miracles. They are not seeking things. They are not looking for God's blessing. They are looking for God. Say with me, the Lord, the Lord. is a portion of my inheritance. I can't hear you. The Lord, the Lord. is a portion. Of my, of my inheritance, not gold, not gold. Nor silver, not, silver. Not, real not real estate. The Lord God Almighty is a portion of my inheritance. He maintains my Lord. The lines are falling unto me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a goodly heritage. You know what God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 15? He said, Abraham, fear not. I am. And your shield, an exceeding great reward. I am not gold, not silver. And how many of you know if you have God, you have all that God has? So, my question this morning is what do you seek? If you want miracle for healing, we'll pray for you and God will answer us, you'll be healed. If you want a job, we'll pray for you and get a job. And then you become a slave to the job. But if you're seeking the Lord, you will lack no good thing. The young lions suffer hunger, 
And they do lack, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. If you don't believe that, do me a favor. Take razor blade and cut that out of your Bible, but you can remove it from mine. Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Do you believe that? Do you seek the Lord? Are you seeking the Lord? If there is lack around you, you are not. You are either ignorant or you don't know what to do or you are seeking things. It's a definite statement, doctor. Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. You will permit my, uh, well, I'm not insane, my madness this morning, but I'm a little bit weird because I don't want you to remain the same. This church has communicated with me in giving and receiving that you must be the best people available in this region. Available to God to change you so that you can turn this city upside down and bring lasting change. Do you understand me? Whether you like it or not, I'm not going to let you remain the same. And that's not pride. I know what I carry. That's not pride. I know the grace of God in me. I am what I am by the grace of God. And I'm willing to impart that grace free of charge this morning so that you leave this place and be able to announce to principalities and powers according to the word of God. In my life, no more luck. As I seek the Lord, no more luck. Now, as it happened before, thank you. As that happened before in any local church where there is no lack. Let me give you a small example. Acts of the Apostle. It's because someone will say, well, the man has been quoting from Old Testament. He's not giving us the New Testament. Do you know my interest this morning, Timisha, darling? I'm not interested in Old Testament this morning. I'm not interested in New Testament this morning. I'm interested in only one testament, the Now Testament, which is you. The letter kills. It is the spirit that gives life. Many people camp around Old Testament. They think that's all that God has done and is doing. And they camp around New Testament. They say that's all that God can do. But God has beaten all records. He has moved from Old into New. Now he's looking at Now Testament. You say, what is Now Testament? It's not Genesis to Revelation. It is you. You, our epistles, written not with pen and ink, but written by the Spirit of God, so that wherever you go, men can read you. They can see the hand of God upon your life. Say to your neighbor, I am the Now Testament. I carry the presence of God everywhere. I am the Now Testament. Testament, I study the old, I study the new, so I can become the now. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God must take on flesh in you. Men who cannot read or write, men who cannot study the Bible, Hebrew or Greek or English, they look at you and they see God. Tell your neighbor, I am God's address. If you're looking for where God dwells, he indwells me. I am God's address. I carry him everywhere. I am the now testament. A piece is not written with ink, not written with pen. A piece is written by the spirit of God so that the whole of humanity can read. Are you with me? I'm going somewhere. Acts of the Apostle. Are you there? Chapter number 4. Verse number 32. Now the multitude of those who believe were of one heart and one soul, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, 
but he had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And what was upon them? Great grace was upon them all. Verse 34, ready, read. Now was there anyone among them? I can't hear you. Oh, you have to read that loud. I don't understand your African-American accent. Read it loud and loud and loud like you're from Africa. When we wake up in the jungles of Africa, we say, you know we are there. We don't pretend. Read it loud and clear. Neither was there any among them who lacked. An entire church multitude. None of them lacked any good thing. And guess what? If God did it before, it simply means he can do it again. Do you believe that? Do you believe that what God has done for one, he can do for all? That Creflo Dollar does not have two heads. That Kenneth Copeland does not have two heads. That Dr. Fred Price does not have two heads. That those saints who have gone don't have two heads. They don't have ten legs. They're just like you. The heroes of the Bible are just like you. God is looking for somebody who is loyal to watch him. His eyes are going to and fro the earth seeking. He sees everybody but he's not looking for everyone. He sees everything. He's seeking those whose hearts are loyal towards him that he might make himself strong. On their behalf. God wants to possess somebody today. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Did you read the story of the woman. With the issue of blood. You read the story. You understand the story. Did Jesus lay hands on her. Huh? Huh? Did Jesus. Prophesy over her life. No, sir. Did Jesus invite her to the meeting. No. She pressed through. With her ailment. Having suffered for 12 years from the hands of doctors, instead of getting better, she was getting worse. And she heard about Jesus and faith rose up within her and she concluded without giving Jesus any chance of how to do it. She concluded, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And she pressed through men and women. She will not be denied. And she grabbed the hem of his garment. And the flow stopped. And Jesus stood still and said, somebody touched me. And you know Peter talks before he thinks sometimes. Peter said, I'm a master. Everybody is present. I mean, what do you mean? He said, this touch is different. Because people are waiting for me to touch them. But this one touched me. And this one touched me. And she came before him shivering. He said, Lord, it is I. He said, yeah. Virtue went out of me. I brought virtue here today. Be ready to receive it. Be ready to touch it. I brought the virtue of God. Oh, you can say, what well, does he mean? That's how those preachers talk. Check my life. Check my story. Check where he brought me from. Check where he's brought me to. Check where I'm going. Ha <laughs> ha. You will know God is at work in me. But the issue is this. If God did it for one person, can he do it for all? I can't hear you. Where is your authority? Give me your authority that what God has done for one, he can do for all. Give me your authority. I'm a trained lawyer. You don't start standing in court and say, it is settled law without proving it. I say, if God did it for one man, he can do it for all people. There must be authority. Mark chapter 5. Don't despise yourself. Don't disqualify yourself. Don't exclude yourself. God has given David to us as a model, a prototype. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. He's looking for those who are empty so that he can fill them. It's those who are too full that will go empty from the presence of God. But those who thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Are you in Mark chapter 5? You sure? Well, 
In Mark chapter 5, look at that woman with the issue of blood. In verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, to who? To herself. If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself the power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you said, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him what? The whole truth of 12 years suffering. The whole truth of 12 years paying money to doctors and not getting better and getting worse. 12 years of lack. 12 years of deprivation. 12 years of loneliness. 12 years of being estranged from people. Told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Jesus did it for all. Question, can he do it for all? Okay, Mark chapter 6. Not my word, God's word. Mark chapter 6. I'm going to have you stand, if need be, on your head, on your leg, whichever way you choose today. You are going to touch. You are going to ask him. You are going to not, you are not leaving me the same way. I'm not leaving this place the same way I came. They say, the way I came here is my business. God, the way I'm going out of here is your business. I'm not taking one affliction out of here. I'm not taking one pain out of here. I'm not taking one lack out of here. All needs are met because you supply the seed and you supply the need. Mark chapter number 6, verse 53. Are you there? Mark 6, verse 53. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genezareth and anchored there. This is a totally different place. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people walked. Recognize, you see, your recognition is what attracts and pulls the anointing towards you. You can say, how dare he talk to me like that? Your business. <laughs> what does he mean he's so cocky? Your business. How can he say God would do it for everybody? Can't you see poverty all around? All around you. Not around me. I said goodbye to poverty a long time ago. We are not cousins. We are not relations. Lack is not my cousin. I don't know them. They can't come near me. Do you understand me? You, uh, you bring any fly around a burning stove. What will happen to it? It will burn off. Flies only play on cold stove. I'm hurt for God. There's no room for demonic manifestation or oppression in my life whatsoever. Do you understand? They recognized him. Immediately the people recognized him, and what did they do? They ran through their whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was, wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country. They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might what? They might touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. So what God did for one woman, she did for all who could touch him. Is there anyone in the house today desperate enough to want to touch him? Stand on your feet and begin to touch him by faith. I'm not going the same way I came. My life cannot remain the same way. I touch you to God. I touch you today by faith. Bring an end to lack in my life. Bring an end to poverty in my life. You are a rich God. I am your son. I am your daughter. In the name of Jesus, I latch unto you by faith. No more lack. I believe your word. No more lack in my life. No more poverty in my life. My struggles must come to an end. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name.
And the people said, Amen. Amen. I want you to congratulate two, three, four people. I said, Did you just hear my testimony? In my life, no more luck. In my life, no more luck. No more luck. No more luck of any good thing. No more luck of any kind. No more luck. No more luck. In my life, in my home, in my ministry, no more luck. 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 In Jesus' mighty name. No more luck. No more luck, 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 no more luck. In Jesus' mighty name, no more luck. Now be seated. Now be seated. No more luck. No more luck. I didn't come all the way from Africa to leave you the same. No more luck. No more luck. No more luck. I didn't come here to go around from house to house. I came to this house. There must be clear evidence of what happened here this weekend. No more luck. 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 The title of our message, concluding message, in these three days, the title of the concluding message is A Solemn Vow Against Poverty and Lack. A Solemn Vow Against Poverty and Lack. Say that with me. Now personalize it and say with me, My Solemn Vow. Against poverty, against lack, my solemn vow, against poverty, against lack. In Psalm 34, verse number 10, I'm going to divide this message into two segments. Segment number one is to find the root cause of lack. I said it last night. In a world of abundance, poverty is a choice. Don't blame anybody. Don't blame the government. Don't blame your parents. Don't blame your relations. Don't blame your friends that cheated you. Just thank God that you're not the cheat. You didn't hear me. You did business with someone who cheated you? Just begin to thank God you're not the cheat. Let him carry it away because God is going to surprise you by increasing you all around. No more luck. We are going to dig deep into the root cause of poverty and luck. So I show it to you. Do you understand me? And you cut it. The axe will be laid to the roots of trees. Every tree that my father has not planted. He has not planted luck in your life. He has not planted poverty in your life. You must use the axe of God's word. Lay it on those roots and cut them off. So I will show you the root cause of poverty And number two, before I leave, that's why I'm going to take my time. I don't care how long it lasts. If you're in a hurry, just go home. Once you look at the root cause of poverty, I will not show you the way out of it. Completely. That no amount of money will frighten you for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter the figure. Because whatsoever heaven gives you to do, it will pay for it. In Psalm 34, verse number 10, what does he say again? Read it with African determination. I don't like this. Read it like a thorough breed. Shouting African, who is confident in his God, who wakes up in the morning and says, Go, go! (laughs) 
That's too loud for you. Then don't go to heaven because it's going to be louder. Thundering, say, with thunder. I mean, can I show you what happened in heaven? <laughs> in, in Revelation chapter 11, he said, there were thunders and louds. If music is too loud here, you are too old. <laughs> Have you seen those guys on the road? <laughs> if it annoys you, you are too old. <laughs> you see President Barack Obama going to Kenya, he wants to touch his roots. So that I will not just be doing swagger. He said, ah! he said lie on his roaring. Ready? 34, 10, Sam, ready, read. Question, what did the young lions do wrong that they lack? So I'm going to take you to animal kingdom. <laughs> so that we can locate the root cause of lack. And this journey, I will show you, is not only the young lions that do lack, even the old lions also do lack. If you see three generations of lions, the grandfather lion, the grandmother lioness, and the corpse, the offspring, the lack. I'm going to show you in the word so that you can find out why your grandfather was poor and your father was poor and you are already enrolled in the school of poverty. You must rise up with a holy anger and say, I'm putting a stop to this. Doctor, there are some things that animals know that men are ignorant of. You didn't hear me. Shall I repeat myself? Sometimes animals are wiser than men. You don't believe that. Let's go to the animal kingdom and show me their gay club. No, you know, am I touching raw nerves? Let's go to the animal kingdom and show me a male dog touching another male dog and say, fill it tonight with rock. <laughs> show me a female cat running another female cat and say, wow, wow, it's so wonderful. No, you won't find animals do what humans are doing to themselves. So Job... The patriarch said, go to the animal kingdom and learn. Job chapter 12. I want to show you the root cause of lack and poverty. Job chapter 12. Verse number 6. Job 12, 6. The tents of robbers prosper, and those who provoke God are secure. In what God provides by his hand. Why would Job be talking this way? Because his miserable comforters were provoking him. Look at verse number four. He said, I am one mocked by his friends who called on God and he answered him, the just and blameless who is ridiculed. Have you been in that situation that you are hungry for God, you are righteous, you choose to win by righteousness, but all hell is breaking loose around you and people begin to mock you and they are telling you it's not working, it's because of this, it's because of that, it's, and they put all blames on you, they put all blames on your family, you are responsible for this trouble. That, we are asked, it was God who took a bet on Job. Job did not know. His friends did not know. It was God who took a wager with Satan. He said, have you considered my servant Job? And when all hell broke loose, his friends who could support him now began to mock him. And he's saying, the tent of robbers prosper, and those who provoke God are secure in what God provides by his hand. But now do what? You're not reading with me. Verse number seven. But now, as the beasts 
and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you who among all these, who are these birds, beasts, fish, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. You don't know miserable comforters, but the birds of the air, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into band. My heavenly father feeds them. They know what you don't know. That's why you are struggling. Say with me, the birds of the air. Birds of the air. They don't sow. They don't, sow. They don't reap. They don't, they don't gather into band. My heavenly father feeds them. So why are you getting hungry? Why are you hungry? Because the birds know what you don't know. Let's practicalize this. I like practical things. I like to leave this place and somebody say, I got it. Do the birds know what you don't know? Follow me to the brook Herod. Elijah was sent by God there. And he said, Elijah, go to the brook Herod. I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. You read the Bible. Read it in Job. Read it as well. The, the, the ravens are the most selfish bird. They don't even feed their offsprings. That's what the Bible says. They're extremely selfish that they will not feed their offspring. But the moment Jehovah commanded them to, to feed the prophet twice daily without fail, they brought bread to the prophet. Whether they were hungry or not, they gave him food first because God commanded them to do it. They didn't argue with God. They didn't say, don't you know this is contrary to our nature? God spoke twice daily. The ravens were there. And now compare the ravens with the widow as Sarifat. God said to Elijah, said, now depart from the brook carried. Why? The brook was drying up. Why was it drying up? Because the king was coming to check every raven areas, every, anywhere you find water. He had commanded his servants to go to the brook, to go everywhere, to go look for grasses for animals. They would have found him there. So before they could come, God said, go to Sarifat. It is six miles. He walked to Sarifat. And God said, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain you there. And when Elijah asked for what I said, that's simple. That's what we like to give to God. Peanuts. Left over. And Elijah said, bring me a cake. Argument started. So who between the widow woman and the ravens as matter? Talk to me. Because the ravens did not argue with God. But the woman began to argue with God. I've gathered two sticks. I'm going to beat my son and myself to death. We are eating our last meal. I can't give you this. I said, woman! Do what I said to you. He sent me here to deliver you. Bring me a muzzle first. Your pot of flour will not dry up. Your pot of oil will not dry up until rains come on the earth. She obeyed God. And she and her entire household lived on limitless possibilities and provision. But she argued. So compare the ravens with her. Who is matter? Thank you. He mentioned birds, but he also mentioned beasts. Go to the beasts. They know these things. Ah, you said, I've never seen any beast who can, who can. <laughs> Shall I tell you about beasts? Balaam's donkey. God opened the mouth of Balaam's donkey to speak with a human.